Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guests today are Brian Andrews and Jeffrey Wilson. The two of them are co-authors of the wildly successful Tier 1 series of books about badass operators, the latest of which is called Red Spectre. It's the fifth book in the series, and it's out today. You can get it on Amazon for your Kindle as an audiobook on a CD or even as a good old-fashioned printed book. That's right, it's out today, right now. You can get sucked into the story of Shadow Warrior and former Tier 1 Navy SEAL John Dempsey as he goes into the Russian criminal underground to root out the perpetrators of an assassination attempt on the President of the United States. Throw in your AirPods and go deep while you pretend you're working today. Brian Andrews is a U.S. Navy veteran and a nuclear engineer who served as an officer on a fast attack submarine in the Pacific. He earned a psychology degree from Vanderbilt and an MBA from Cornell, and he's a husband and father who would someday like to set foot on the moon. Jeffrey Wilson has been an actor, a firefighter, a paramedic, a jet pilot, a driving instructor, a naval officer, and when he's not writing Tier 1 books with Brian, he has a day job as a vascular and trauma surgeon. Let that sink in a minute. Jeff served two tours in Iraq as a combat surgeon with both the Marines and with a Joint Special Operations Task Force. These guys are both amazing dudes who tell stories for our enjoyment. Now, I want to take a second to invite you to support our favorite cause, Save the Brave at SaveTheBrave.org. They are a certified 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to helping veterans cope with post-traumatic stress. You can read all about them and donate a few bucks to help them help some veterans who can use a hand. Pete and I both support Save the Brave with our time and with our recurring contributions right out of our PayPal accounts. Mine came out yesterday, same day every month. And Scott Husing supports them too. He serves on their board. They do great work, and we urge you to support them as well. If you would buy a combat veteran lunch once a month, and you know you'd do that, that's all we're asking, and you can set up a recurring PayPal contribution and read about them right at SaveTheBrave.org. Please consider it. We'd also like you to support the Break It Down show on whatever platform you're listening to us, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube. Please help us out with a five-star rating and a positive review. It helps new listeners find us, and we really appreciate you doing it, and we appreciate you listening, and you can rate us and review us while you're listening and pretending you're working today. So, go get Red Spectre. It's out as of right now. Right after you listen to our guests today, here come Brian Andrews and Jeffrey Wilson. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan East. This is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> Hey, this is Brian Andrews. And I'm Jeff Wilson. We're the authors of the Tier 1 series. And our latest release is Red Spectre. And we're talking to you on the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, indeed. Yes, you are. You know we love authors. You know we love veterans. And I love Tier 1 anything. We actually just recently, fellas, did a whole week of Tier 1 operators to include, and this is crazy, the guy who was D.B. Cooper was an operator, uh, not only in the military, but also for the CIA. And uh, they, we figured out who he is. It's not a mystery anymore. And uh, that's the ultimate operator because that guy dealt in gold cougarans and could fly helicopters and was a master diver. And he was just this incredible, incredibly dishonest, but also incredible operator. So <laughs> cool. Yeah, I want to read that book. Yeah, there there actually is a book. I'll, I'll send you guys a link to it later on. Uh, I guess let's let's talk a little bit about your guys' backgrounds because um, I sort of feel like a slouch with what you guys have done. But just briefly, Jeff, would you start and kind of give us an idea of your background? Yeah, well, my background, if you ask my mom, is that I apparently can't keep a job. So uh, I've done a I've done a number of different things uh, over the years. I'm a by education, I'm a physician. I'm a vascular and trauma surgeon uh, by training. But I started out in aviation, followed my dad's footsteps. I was a pilot for a while, uh, was a firefighter paramedic for a while, 
then I did some work with some other government agencies for a short period of time. And after that experience, decided to go to medical school and live a life of peace. And then they crashed those planes into the towers and it pissed me off. So that didn't work out. And I wound up going back into the Navy. So uh, my military experience has basically been a short attempt at aviation and then a number of years as a combat surgeon, first with the Marines and then mostly with Naval Special Warfare. Yeah. And that's a significant thing. So you and I are sort of um, different birds of the same feather, I suppose, because, you know, as a combat spy, I go out with the SEALs, Special Forces, other governmental agencies. And though I don't have a tab or, you know, a trident, I'm working alongside these guys, you know, earning their respect and trust. And it's guys like us that are able to go out on these kind of missions. You, you get to do that because you're good at your job. I mean, it's one thing to say I'm a vascular surgeon, but if your hands are shaking the second you leave the camp, you know, you're like, hey, we're just driving right now. You know? but, so you have so to you have. get it. Pete. It's like it's like going to graduate school without going to high school first. Right. It's, Seriously. Uh, yeah. 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 For sure. And they have no problem going. You're not on the team. But not saying those oh, yeah. words, just by their actions. You're like, where's all my gear? And, you, and no one talks to you. Like, you just don't exist anymore. So to, to be able to work at that level, you know, we're not, quote, unquote, tier one guys. No one's funding us. But they do have us around for a reason. Hey, this is P. Day Turner from the Break It Down Show checking in real quick to ask you this. John, Scott, and I all support Save the Brave with our time, our location, our effort, and our money. Each month, we give a small amount. Do the same with us. Go to savethebrave.org, click on the Donate tab, pick an amount that you want to come out each month, and they will handle all the rest. I stand behind these folks. Thank you so much. Let's get back to the show. But they do have us around for a reason. Jeff, uh, what's your background? I'm sorry, Brian, what's your background? Yeah, my background is uh, I was an officer in the uh, submarine community. So I served on a uh, 688 class fast attack submarine. And um, then after I got out of the Navy, uh, was uh, an entrepreneur before I went into uh, this writing, down the writing rabbit hole. Yeah. Okay. And again, for those that don't know, submariners are special in their own right. You guys, you have an extraordinary, you have nice conditions. You don't have to go live on the side of a mountain, but you do have to live under the water <laughs> for a lot of your <laughs> career. Uh, how in the heck does a vascular surgeon, naval special um, warfare guy team up with the submarine? How did you guys even get together? He's a stalker. It was. It, it's as simple <laughs> as that. Yeah. You know, Brian. Brian and I were debut authors the same year. He had a debut book out, his first novel, and so did I. And we met at Thriller Fest in New York, which is something ITW does every year. It's a huge meeting. My favorite thing to do. It was my first time ever. So. I'm not very social, Pete. So, you know, when I was at this thing, I've got my wife and I'm sitting in my hotel room, like trying to circle the names of the people that are in the military. So I can just talk to those guys. And you know what I mean? You, yeah. you know what I'm talking about. It's hard in those settings. So he was one of the people I, I circled and we were at this first cocktail party. I look over at this table and there's this guy sitting by himself. I was like, well, that must be Brian Andrews. Cause it said he's a submariner and he's not talking to anyone. Uh, so <laughs> I walked over and introduced myself and we became friends. Our family uh, situation is the same. Our, our wives are the same. We had kids the same age. We just really hit it off. We were both Navy veterans and uh, that's sort of how we met. And then Brian, why don't you tell them how, how we started writing the series? Cause I don't remember. I woke up one day and all of a sudden I couldn't write books by myself anymore. I remember at that cocktail party, I, I think Jeff was, he was crying in the corner. If I recall, <laughs> you were sucking your thumb maybe at the time. And I brought you a drink and I said, you know, it'll be okay. Like, I know this is traumatic. There's a lot of other human beings here, but uh, we can get through this together. And, and after that, he sort of latched on. And uh, that's how I remember it happening. And then he was talking about all the words and how these books had so many words. Uh, and it was just hard to do, you know, put so many words together by himself. And I thought that that'd be a perfect opportunity for us to team up and uh, we could cut the number of words that we each had to generate in half. <laughs> Maybe we could come up with, with an interesting product. Uh, but ser all seriously, the, uh, all kidding aside, uh, you know, we had just, I think Jeff had just finished his third book and I had finished my second. Like Jeff was saying, we met at this Thriller Fest, great organization, the Thriller Fest conference. And we had seen each other a couple years in a row 
So we had, our, you know, each year we were getting to be better and better friends. And at that particular year, you know, we were both in between stuff. I was like, what are you doing next? Next, He's like, I'm not sure. I said, he said, what are you doing next? I said, I don't, I don't really know. I just had this brainstorm. I thought it could be kind of cool to uh, co-author something, especially coming from the military background, collaboration, you know, teamwork. That's what it's all about. You don't do missions by yourself. You know, everybody's working as a team and that's what I was used to. And quite frankly, writing can be a, a lonely activity. So I said, you know, I, I got this experience in subs. You've got this experience in special warfare. What if we teamed up and did like a, a seals and subs, uh, book together and he he looks at me and he smiles nicely and he's like yeah i, I don't i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> i'll let jeff tell the rest of the story and that is true i did turn him down a couple of times but i told him you know because i had this background i knew a lot of guys and i said you know i'd, I'd love to help you because we were good friends at that at that point i said i can help you do this you know, tell me about your story. And he didn't really have one. He just had sort of the beginnings of an idea. So we brainstormed this thing for a couple of weeks. Long story short, he gets to the point where he asks the third time. He says, look, I really think we could do this together. Why don't we do this? We'll write five chapters. And if it's working, great. And if not, you can have the story. And at that point, I mean, the story was pretty developed. And it was, I was kind of excited about it. I was like, wow, I can't turn that down. So we uh, started writing the book. And I think it took about 15, 16 weeks to write the whole thing. It wow. just... It was amazing. And every book since, I mean, it just, it's, a, it's an amazing partnership. So we just, we're blessed. We got very lucky uh, that we just have a similar, you know, writing style and business a, approach to writing, I suppose. So. so, and we're talking to Brian Andrews and Jeff Wilson, these guys write as a team. You can get more about, in, you can get more information about them at andrews-wilson.com. I'll put that in the show notes if you miss it, but it's andrews-wilson.com. Uh, you guys put out one of these Red Specter series books. Wait, is it? No, you guys put out one of these tier one books a year. The, the current one's called Red Specter. Everybody can get them at Amazon. And, and look, you all know the deal. If you're going to buy the book, do a favor of rating that book, giving it five stars. That is how the book gets discovered by the people. And that's how we keep Brian and Jeff doing what they're doing. Uh, Jeff, why on earth is a vascular surgeon trying to become an author? It's so hard to be an author and sell books. Yeah, you know, that's it. obviously that's a, a common question um, for me. But the thing about writing for me is that, like I was saying earlier, I've, I've had a little bit of a, a crazy life. I've done so many different things. Uh, and, it, and I joke about my mom saying I can't keep a job, but it does kind of look like that on paper, jumping from career to career. But writing actually is the thread. Like I started writing when I was very young. I published my first short story when I was 14. So with all of these other things I've done in and out of different careers, the one thing I always did was write. So I never know how to answer that question because for me, it wasn't a, a change to go from these other things to writing. It was starting to write full time instead of always having it in the background. And I think any good writer uh, has got a rich life experience. That's what makes them good writers. You know, you look at the top of their field. They're not guys for the most part. There's a few exceptions that have a bachelor's in creative writing. There are guys in the military. They're attorneys. They're physicians. They're people that have had real life experience. Uh, so for me, it was pretty easy to just switch over to something I loved already. And Jeff, being an author is hard. You have to be salesman of the year in your company every single year. As you guys know, writing a book, it's like, oh, I write five chapters, no big deal. I mean, that's crippling to people who aren't authors. So for you guys, writing is one thing, but selling, going to the conferences, going to the book signings, it's a lot of work. What else did you think you were going to be doing if, if this hadn't have worked out? I mean, you're a submariner. You have very specific skills that you can do. You likely could go into contracting. Um, what were you going to do before this worked? Well, I think um, one of the things that is a common misconception is that, you know, authors, everyone hears the stories about the authors that, you know, their first book hits it big. They get this, you know, rags to riches sort of story and the seven figure contract and they're off to the races. And, you know, that is a gross, you know, misconception. Those stories are fun. They get a lot of media attention, but this business is like so many other businesses where, you know, it truly is um, um, a business with a lot of competition where sort of the top, you know, 1% of the authors are raking in the lion's share uh, of the, of the revenue. 
So, you know, when you start out in this business, most people do not say, hey, one day I just want to be a full time author. You're, 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 it's a side hustle in the beginning, right? It's a labor of love. It's something you're doing because you have this story inside you or stories that you want to tell. And um, so you do that labor of love. You're working on it on nights and weekends and you're doing your day job. And, you know, I think that it's not until you reach a certain level of success. Uh, and maybe it's more success than you thought you would have to achieve before you really feel comfortable saying, okay, I'm going to cut ties to whatever it is that I'm doing and, and become a full-time author. And even at that point, that can be a little nerve wracking. So, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough that I had been successful in my entrepreneurial ventures sort of after business school and after the Navy that, you know, I felt comfortable enough to go ahead and after I had a couple books under my belt and Jeff and I had the tier one series rolling. It wasn't until that tier one series was up and rolling that I said, okay, I feel comfortable enough to step into this full time. And then as far as, you know, plan B, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I don't have a plan B at this point and probably should, but at the same time, like I want to give this up my 100%. This is my all. So, you know, right now, this is, this is my career. This is my adventure and what I plan to keep on doing, you know, God willing. But before you had, I mean, obviously the plan B, all the ships are burned. You guys are, you guys are authors now, but was it going to be something entrepreneurial for you, Brian, like after the Navy? Yeah, I, I went to business school at Cornell and, and got my MBA and, and started a business here in, uh, in the Midwest. And uh, I did that for 10 years. So um, yeah, bootstrapped it and, and uh, was quite successful at that. So that, that gave me a little bit of breathing room, you know, you got to kind of build up a war chest, so to speak, if you're going to get into this writing business, because it doesn't monetize right away. You no, know, it's it sort sure of a, tri it's a triple. Yeah. And then it, it seems like someone's going to discover your series every so often, now, hopefully constantly, but you're going to find someone and they're going to say, I need to buy every single book. So they buy the first book, they buy all of them. And then you're just slowly adding those those streams while you continue to add new opportunities by having new books. Is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's, you know, the first book, it uh, you get a big splash. We were lucky the first book in that series did very, very well. And so we had this big splash. And then a few months later, all of a sudden, it's like these little tiny checks are coming. And you're like, uh-oh, right? <laughs> um, but that's that's less scary every year that the backlist gets bigger and bigger and that that low point gets a little higher and higher. And so you've always got a little bit more constant. So we've been very, very lucky um, the way that the way it's worked. But it's true. What you're saying is definitely true, Pete. Like when Red Spectre comes out, the first four books, their sales are all going to go up because you get all that marketing and promotion for book five. And there's always those people like, oh, I haven't heard of this. What's this? Let me start at the beginning. And but yeah, the bigger the list, the backlist gets, the easier it is to stomach that uh, the four months of low point. Yeah, it's uh, similar in the podcast world. There's 560 plus episodes of our show, and it has been for a long time that the backlist will always outperform the premiere show. Always. But, you know, you need to constantly add back shows because the really right. early shows don't outperform the the current show you know they all get ones and twos and that kind of thing but it, it takes a lot of uh it takes a lot of repetition and a lot of content to get to that point okay we've got the tier one series you're cranking out a book a year i'm assuming that that's i don't want to minimize the effort it takes to do that but that's a known pattern you guys know what to do when to get to work how to do it how do you guys do the editorial part of the pre-production of the next thing of the, you know, like outside of this series or right, with exactly. Um, you know, it's, it was easier before when, when you're just putting out a, a book a year, when tier one first came out, they did the second book in six months, then nine. Now we're stabilized at one a year, which gives us a little breathing room. Uh, and actually, uh, the timing of this podcast is perfect because we can now legally announce it. We, um, have been working on other, other ventures. So, um, <laughs> that's my uh, breaking news crap. So what SOS. we would do is we would we would brainstorm these other ideas, you know, during that three or four months you'd have between developmental edits and starting the new book. And uh, one of the ideas we had was for a spinoff series from Tier One. We have a character in Tier One who's a uh, SEAL operator, a, an officer who has been a minor character in a couple of the books, and the fans have loved him. We've gotten a lot of mail about him. We're like, what if we spin off? In our series, the tier ones, 
unit gets wiped out, the Navy's JSOC unit gets uh, ambushed and killed. And so eventually they got to stand up a new one. And we're like, what if we did a series where Keith Redman, this chunk Redman, uh, we just follow him as he evolves to the new tier one SEAL team. And so we were able to get that book together as a proposal for a three book series. And uh, we just recently signed a contract with uh, Blackstone. So that series will be coming out next year. But to answer your question, we're trying to find those months and you're like, do months where you have that downtime. And then it's like, now we got to write. Okay. Now we got developmental editing. Oh, now it's time for marketing promotion book tour, that kind of thing. So it gets hard. Uh, but once you get in that groove um, of scheduling, it gets easy. But scheduling is the key to the whole thing. That's for sure. How much do you guys, Brian, how much do you guys need to be in the same room to figure certain things out? I mean, obviously you guys have messed with the formula, but talk to me about what it takes to get a book created. Well, uh, I think this is the great thing about our partnership is that, um, and we talk about this a lot, you know, when you're writing by yourself, if you get stuck, you're stuck until you figure it out. Uh, but by working together, you know, if we're working on something, let's say I, I'm working on a chapter and I get stuck, it's, I just give Jeff a call immediately. I don't, I don't waste time. I give him a call. Okay, I'm stuck. Here's what I'm working on. Let's brainstorm. Let's, you have any ideas? And he'll be like, oh, yeah, well, have you thought about this? I'll say, no, I haven't. And we'll work, this, we'll work through it. And um, so there is no writer's block uh, when you're a co-op because uh, somebody's always there as a backup. The ball is always rolling. So that's, that's one really nice thing about this venture, the way we have it set up, is that you know we're both working every single day, but we're working on different elements of the business and it really is a small business i think that's a good model say you know as a writing team we have our this this series or these two series now this is our business so we do have the all the different elements that jeff talked about with the marketing promotion and the planning and the budgeting and all that sort of stuff um but the fun stuff the fun stuff is what you're talking about pete which is like when we think about a new concept how are we going to start this new book and so every new project, we start off with the brainstorming session where it really starts with what we call a what if question. So, you know, in a lot of our books, like tier one's a perfect example, you know, the, the what if question is, you know, what if terrorists wiped out the whole tier one? Like, what, what would we do? Like, what would the ramifications be? Is it fictional? Yes. But is it interesting? Absolutely. So, you know, with Red Spectre, we said, you know, what if the Russians had a mole at the highest level? of the uh, of the office of uh, ZNI. What what would the implications be there? And and that first question gets the ball rolling. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. So the ball gets rolling. It's always a mole, right? So at some point you guys <laughs> be like, it can't always be a mole. We need right. something else. Uh, good is the ev is like the opposite of great, right? So when you guys are considering these things, the mole system works all the time, but surely you guys must go, God, I'm sick of it being a mole. What can we do this time? Well, one thing we did different, because I agree with you, the, the, the struggle in this genre is avoiding trite. Right. And it's, it gets harder every year, right? Because there's great books out there. We've got a lot of very good friends uh, that are writing great books and, you know, we can't just make every book the same. So when we decided that we wanted to have this, we didn't want to focus on that aspect of it. We needed that to be able to be sort of a, more of a backstory. So the mole in this story is a backstory. The, the, the front story for the second trilogy, because we do write these book in, books in trilogy. The first three books are sort of our Persian trilogy where Iran is the puppet master doing false flag operations. Uh, which certainly isn't fiction, as you well know. Uh, and then the second uh, series of books, uh, this is the second in the trilogy, book five, Russia comes to the forefront as uh, sort of the false flag operator. And so the question for us was, what if this mole was happening? What would they be able to do with that? And what they're able to do with it in our book is they're able to come up with an Ember task force equivalent. And so we have the you know, new tier one pitted against the Russians, new tier one uh, blend of operators and espionage. And so what would that look like publicly when we're not at war and how does that play out? And so that would, that's right. We should have called you because that's right in your, right in your wheelhouse to be asking those questions. But uh, so we tried to make that the forefront and the background was the mole. Um, and that made it a little more interesting for us. We can't write boring because we get bored and then uh -huh. we can't. 
So, yeah. so that helped. We're just very immature uh, and have a little bit of attention deficit disorder. Which this helps. this was part of what I wanted to transition into is, is uh, I, I know from doing my show, whatever interests me is going to interest the audience. Like I just I know that now and I uh, it's scary at times, but 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 I rely on that. You guys must now have a sense of let's not worry too much about the audience because we know this is good. We're having a great time writing it. It's going to do great. Is that? Am I that's right. And that's you know, I made it. I made a joke. We're kind of immature, but uh, well, we are a little immature. But that it actually is part of our secret sauce because we have to be excited about it. And so you know, Brian talked about the brainstorming, and it sounds you know very very business like and very professional. It's not. It's more like two eight-year-olds in the backyard with a toy rifle saying, what if this happened? What if this happened? What if this happened? I mean, we get excited. We are like kids in the brainstorming phase and even during the writing when we think of new ideas. And so if we can make it exciting to us and it can unfold like a story we're watching, uh, then we get excited and it's going to make the reader excited, or at least it seems to work so far. We'll see. What are your thoughts on the whole, you have to tell the mole story because it works so good, but where, where do you fill your well? So that you're not just like, I got it, a Russian mole, you know, kind of thing. Where, where does where does your inspiration come from? Well, I think just to sort of go back to what Jeff's saying, one of the key differences, something we feel like we, we've done differently than uh, our competition or maybe what, something that separates out our series from others in the genre is that we are using these nest, these back-to-back trilogies. And what that means is that instead of each book, you meet a new villain and sort of follow this cookie cutter plot of, okay, there's a villain. He wants to destroy the world or destroy this or that. And we're going to wrap it up by the end of the story. You know, when we started this series, Jeff and I said, you know, that's not how real life works. You know, like bad guys that are, you know, uh, dictators, they stick around for a long time. And and so do their lieutenants and and so do their, their operators. Right. So there is a longitudinal component all of our adversaries and so we wanted to uh, recognize that it's a little tricky in fiction because people like to have a story tied up in a nice neat little bow at the end so it feels fulfilling but uh, what we've managed to do is say okay we're going to follow this villain longitudinal arc so yes our heroes are there in every book but what sort of the, the thrust of this this approach is is that you get to know the bad guys really well. You're getting to see the uh, story unfold from two perspectives, bad guys and good guys. And over that three books, you're, you understand their command and control and their hierarchy. We get into the interpersonal relationships that they have and their families and their things that are stressful for them. So yes, characters do die. There is attrition, but it's set over a longer period of time. And that makes it really interesting. So For example, this mole who is really sort of at the forefront of book five, she was introduced in book three, but it wasn't the the, the readership didn't know she was a mole. You've just been following her career at ODNI for the last three, uh, you know, for, for two books now. And it's not until book five where you're like, oh, shit, I didn't see that coming. Or maybe you did see it coming. Maybe you're always suspicious. But it's a lot more fun if you've gotten to know how this character has been sort of undermining the efforts of our team. And maybe you just thought she was a difficult person, difficult character, um, when in fact she had a secondary agenda. So that's kind of a twist on the mole element, too, is that you've gotten to know her in her personal life, you know, over three books. Interesting. Yeah, I love that. The the whole organizational uh, flow, how those guys run their uh, their villainy and all that kind of thing. There, there's a lot of interesting things there. Um, I always think back, like, you know, commanders have to do a lot of things in addition to closing with and destroying the enemy. They have to feed people. They have to provide aid to people. <laughs> you know, it's like they have to move poop. Um, all yeah. these things have to happen in addition to to the mission. It's not just all like evils, like <laughs> mustache twisting. Right. You know? Like, ah, God damn it. I got to go kill this guy. But I promised my kid I'd be there for opening day of Little League, you know. So, right. like- and isn't that isn't that more interesting when, you know, we do that with our protagonists, too, for sure. Yeah. The, one of the commitments we made early on was we're not going to have these Man of Steel superhero seal characters. We're going to yeah. 
we're going we're gonna to produce these characters that are like the men I serve with that go to the baseball game. That's a great example that, that stop by and get milk on the way home, that on Thursday morning roll the trash can out to the curb. But when they have to go do their job, it's an extraordinary thing. And so we worked very hard to do that. And we decided early on, the antagonist has to be the same, right? They have to also have a personality. And so instead of the supervillain, like you're saying, the <laughs> you know, we have our char- our character talking about his wife and her questioning his motives and his interactions with his children and his cousin, who's also in this other job. And, and so you, you don't, I don't think you sympathize with them, but you see them as real people because it's the age old thing, right? Like every bad guy is a good guy in his mind. Yeah. And you know, he doesn't think of himself as a bad guy. He thinks we're the bad guys. To him, he's the good guy. And if you paint him that way, they're just more interesting. As a writer, they're more fun to write. But as a reader, hopefully, they're a lot more interesting to read also. Yeah, this is something that I wanted to get into. And I'm glad I get a chance to finally do that with somebody. Because uh, speaking from my own combat experience, and I know this isn't a proper word, but I, I think we'll be able to get there with this. It, it's, um, I think these stories in real life are more about co-tagonists where you're each doing your own timeline and sometimes you interact with each other and you're contagonists or whatever, but that co-tagonist, it's like we're co-belligerents. Yes. We're on the same battlefield. We have different goals and outcomes. You might be in the way of something today um, or I might need you to be distracted by something. So I've got to interact with you, but you're right. Like that tribal leader He's there doing what he has to do because I'll I'll tell you, I've talked to tribal elders, right? And their phones ring nonstop and they're doing human service when this happens. My son got arrested. So-and-so had a baby. My auntie needs a job. So-and-so is desperate for some money. You know, these are the things they're trying to solve. Meanwhile, I'm like, but I thought this guy's an evil bad guy, but he's not except for in the right context, you know? Right. Context is everything. And and in uh, and that war in particular, right? Look at Iraq. You remember going over in like 2003, 2004 and shooting up a bunch of bad guys and then coming back in nine and you were fighting alongside those guys. And then you see these scars, and you're like, I might have caused that scar. And now he's now he's like my butt. It's it's weird. And so I think that was part of that inspiration is seeing, you know, in Afghanistan uh, and even more so in Iraq, there was a lot of that. Um, where things, these, these lines get so blurred. Boy. And I think that's what made the protagonist so interesting to me and to Brian is the idea that you got to see them as motivated people instead of just the objective or the bad guy or the things standing between us and the free world. Or, you know, it's not like the Cold War. So you had the evil empire and you had the good guys and it that's was right. just clear cut. And it's just not like that anymore. And so writing that gray in makes the story a lot more interesting because that's reality. That's real life. When I was in Zabul province, I was talking to the farmers trying to understand, you know, the Taliban ties. And and this is for the audience. There's a program. They were like, hey, Taliban guys, come out of the hills. There's programs. There's money. There's support. If you just reject the Taliban way. Well, the guy in charge of that in this particular era, in this particular time, the guy in charge of that program, the American, he couldn't make a Taliban guy show up. So I'm trying to understand, like, all these resources are here, in theory, to get these guys to come back and, and rejoin society. So I'm asking the questions that lead to these conversations. And a farmer says to me, the Taliban is from this area. I'm indirectly but closely related to Mullah Omar, who's like the icon of Taliban. You know, he's this one armed or one eyed guy and hard to kill. And, you know, he has like these Ark of the Covenant moments with this Islam and everything. And he points off in the distance. And I, I know that he's pointing like towards where Mullah Omar, like he's pointing in the right direction. Like he's like he comes from right over there, literally a couple hour drive in shitty ass, hard to get around Afghanistan. So maybe maybe 50 miles. And he's like, I can't reject. These guys are this place. They are from here. This is their origin. So to, to reject that makes no sense at all. So here we have like the people that were there to try to unseat. And yet they are, they are the area. Right. It's, you know, we tried to, it's so funny that you bring that up today because we're working on, we're just finishing up the first book in the new series called Sons of War. And they're in, Afghanistan and cross border into Pakistan and stuff. And we try to flesh some of that out for the reader. The idea that like 
you get far enough up in the Hindu Kush, there is no Afghanistan, there is no Pakistan. There's just this tribe and that tribe, and they're all Pashtun. And that border means nothing to anybody except for politicians hundreds of miles away in the two countries. And if you don't understand that, if you can't accept that, then you're not going to be able to deal with these people. You can't function in that environment without getting your head around that concept. And it's so foreign to us in the West, right? Like I'm from Florida. I was raised in Virginia. I'm from, I'm an American. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Florida. I was raised in Virginia. I'm from, I'm an American. There's no... There is none of that. I'm from this uh, tribe. That's all that matters. Like, look, dude, I get that he slaughtered all those people. I feel bad too, but you know, he's married to my cousin. So what are you going to (laughs) do? This is why like, and and this has nothing to do with the presidential election, but when Joe Biden said, we're just going to divide Iraq into three pieces, like you are a fucking fool. You have no (laughs) idea what you're talking about. And by the way, where you want to divide it is going to be a problem, you know, (laughs) because there's not enough Uh, moving resources around is not the answer because it drives them literally batshit crazy you know if you bring electricity or fresh water to an area the area one step away even if they're next they're like they got the deal we didn't get it fuck you guys we're going to war you know (laughs) there's a crazy story this you guys will appreciate this and i'll tell this fast it's a crazy story of afghanistan where um uh, young guy A and young guy B go and rob somebody, right? And then as they're leaving, they drive through village one on their way to their home in village two, right? So A and B drive through one to get to two. Well, one and two don't get along. <laughs> and so when the cops come to go get A and B and capture these guys, the uh, people in village two are like, fuck you, we're going to go kill those guys. But first, we're going to kill you cops because no one drives through our village. And so you have Village 1 fighting ultimately to defend the guys from Village 2 against the main. Like, it breaks your brain when you go and you fit, you find these stories and you're like, wait, what? And they're like, we know we don't like each other in Village 1 and Village 2, but we sure as fuck don't like the government. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go and try to fuck with it. Yeah. We can great. fix it. You just need free elections. Yeah. Yeah. That'll solve everything. And then so just to take that whole idea and blow it out to a national level, the folks in Afghanistan, and I'm painting with a big brush, the folks in Afghanistan do not like the folks from Pakistan. However, if you're in Pashtunistan, you drive around wherever you want. You know, if the best medical care is in Pakistan, you don't care about that. You're happy to go over there, but you do not want Pakistan influence in Afghanistan, except for when it benefits your tribe specifically. That's Same right thing there, in Iraq and Iraq. Right there in that middle part, Afghanistan and Pakistan both end at about JBAT. Yeah. And after everything in north of that, that's neither place, right? It's, it's, yeah, it really, we talk to people all the time that regularly commuted there. First off, how the hell they were doing that, you know, in the cars that they had over the roads that were there was shocking. So these people are desperate to do this. And you're right, like it's it was no big deal. And then I would go talk to these folks and they I would ask one of the questions I would say is like, like what's the hardest legal problem you guys solved? Like up to and including murder, because there's nothing worse than murder. And they're like, Yeah, we had a murder thing two weeks ago that we dealt with. But it's all handled civilly, not legally on the punitive side. So it's it's a civil crime, not a not a uh, um not another kind of crime. So when you put all these things together in your guys' stories, and I know we've gotten pretty far afield, how do you break that stuff down? Because that's some complex shit I just talked about. <laughs> Brian? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that the the not so simple, but this we're going to go with this answer, is that we try to focus on just the human element. So with uh, this new book, uh, Sons of War, you know, the antagonist, he's quite a tragic fellow. And um, we're telling his story. It's, he's got a point of view and uh, you're with him for the whole book. And you really get to see the tragedy of sort of his life and how he just slowly slips into 
uh, this vengeance model. Like he didn't start there, uh, but through a series of events, that's where he ends up. And, you know, you sort of develop some empathy for the guy. And if you don't, you're kind of a heartless human being because uh, he has real, real tragedy in his life. And then at some point, then you, you, the switch might flip because now he's doing some stuff that you say, okay, now I, I went from feeling bad for this guy to, uh, you know, feeling very uncomfortable to just not like him. You know, like now, now I've moved him over to the bad guy camp. And that was very deliberate, deliberate, and we've tried to uh, sort of titrate that over the length of the whole book. And um, I think that that makes for a much more effective understanding of his culture and his stressors and everything if you're along for the ride. So that's how we tried to do that is you're seeing this all happen through his eyes, and it's through that, that walk a mile in somebody else's shoes that you pick up this 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 complexity yeah i think that's exactly right i mean that's you, if you do it through a character if you do it through pov it, you know the like you know pete there's so much complexity like the story you just told that's like that's a perfect story of this region and that's where we were in this book in uh, sons of war we're in pakistan and afghanistan up in that region you know what used to be the fodder region on pakistan side and um it's so hard. To, you, you have a lot of information and this is true in anything in writing. You have all this information and you almost feel this moral obligation to barf all of the things you know down onto the page. <laughs> so your reader will know them too. And there's nothing that destroys a novel faster than that. And so it requires a little bit of self-control and a little bit of discipline. But I think what Brian said is exactly right. If you do it through character, through character development, and you don't have to really explain that whole backstory, you just have to pull out enough element in his introspection and his conversation that you get a hint of it, that you get a hint that while wow, there's a lot of complex stuff. So you have a little dialogue where one of your army intelligence guys is talking to a CIA guy and say, hey, dude, that's not that simple. Look, and he tells a little story and it gives it just enough back note that they get the character. And if you end there, you're probably successful. Your temptation is to keep going and then that's what editing is for and you have to chop all that out but um i think that's the way you do it you do it by making the characters real so that you care about them and then you put in little little notes through their interaction and their backstory what are the things i know from being in combat um let me back up and say a lot of my peers aren't aren't down with there being ladies in combat and i will tell you that where you've been they already are there right um, and they'll say something like, well, women get hurt in combat more than anybody else. What I know is this. Everybody gets hurt in combat, whether it's a long term injury, short term, something that presents later on. Every single person is burning capability in years of their life. How do you guys represent that? Is this something you have to make more obvious? Do you just not deal with it? I don't think that's going to be the case here. But how do you guys deal with that slow erosion of our capability, of our mental well-being that, that we're all sacrificing in these super hard, challenging environments? Oh, so I didn't see where you were going. I thought you were going to talk about women in combat. And you, then you deflected. Okay. Uh, so I think that you do that through the same thing that Brian was saying uh, with these other complex, you know, protagonist uh, or antagonist social issues is you th show it through characterization. You show it through, you know, the combat stress. You don't have a character that has a breakdown of PTSD because you and I both know that happens. That is not the majority. The majority of people is just a slow simmering thing that they deal with all the time. And I think that you can flesh out in your characters and their interactions with one another. We are trying in this new series in the first book, it's hard, but as we evolve this new series, we want to have some of the family element in there. We have one character, uh, Saw is his name. He's a uh, he's, uh, family guy who was thinking about getting out. And, and you can totally relate to this, Pete, that idea of like every time you think you get out of here, like, well, maybe one more, you know, I could just do, I can't have them go without me. What if they went without me? And so he's in that stage of life. And so we hope to flesh out some of those family relationships because I think that's an awesome way to bring some of that to the forefront. If you, you may not be able to really flesh out the impact on the human soul of the, of the operator, but if you can show the impact on the family, then I think you get at least a glimpse behind that curtain. Brian, are there times when you have to bring Jeff back from the edge? He's like, I need someone to get shot because we're going to talk about an arterial cut down in a helicopter. <laughs> like, is, is he always going for some kind of a uh, big medical jump? He gave it to me. He gave it to me in Crusader 1. It was awesome when Grind got shot. It was fantastic. 
Go ahead, Brian. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you, you, it's funny you ask that question because a lot of times I think because Jeff is so familiar with this stuff um, and he's conscious of, I don't, I don't want to just spew my, my knowledge on the page. He maybe holds back a little too much. So sometimes I'll be like, dude, you, you can write more, like put, put some more medical stuff in there, some more trauma, because that's interesting. A lot of people aren't familiar with that world. So I would say it's almost the opposite. Like I have to encourage him to put some of that stuff in there. And I think after he does, he's, he's like, uh, you know, are you sure people want to read this? I'm like, oh yeah, definitely. And, and so we have some, we have some interesting scenes through the series and, and, and I'm very grateful uh, that I get to work with somebody who's got so much experience in so many different avenues like Jeff does, because he brings the level of detail and realism to, to the story that I could never do by myself. And, um, you know, one of the things when you were talking about the, the degradation and, and the breakdown, we, it's kind of funny, like in our very first book together, that tier one book, the opening sequence, our hero gets shot in the back and he's wearing his sappy plate, but it, it, it breaks his, it fractures a vertebrae in his spine. And, and we did that for that very reason of saying, you know what, he is not Superman. Like he had a pretty nasty injury and he convalesces and he has to decide whether he's going to stay in. And this is in the first third of the very first book of the series. We did this. And he has this nagging injury that just sort of bothering him through the rest of the series. And it, it sort of rears its ugly head whenever he's in stress or whenever he's done pushed himself a little too much. And for us, that's a constant reminder that this is not an easy job. You know, in addition to the emotional element, there's this physical component. So it's always there for him, you know, and it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for, for, for what the operator goes through. And then we had Mun working in the VD clinic, but we'll tell that story another day. <laughs> <laughs> but so let's go back to um the females in combat thing too because i'm interested in in where that might go uh again like i always say where you've been they're already in combat they're running guns and gun turrets and i mean like when i say this with respect man-sized guns like 50 cals you know that is not a little weapon just to charge the handle you've got to really have some some commitment so what are your thoughts on on this and how it impacts your stories well, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, my guess is my thoughts on women in combat match most people in the military and the politicians can bloviate all they want. But the reality is, as you said, they're there. And as long as you have the best person doing that job, I don't care who they are or where they came from. I don't care what their race is, their sex is. It makes no difference. But like you said, they're there and you can't ignore it. But on the other hand, we don't want to sensationalize it like people do either. There's a, so many works out there where they have, you know, the woman superhero and all the men are just like babbling idiots in the background and that's not reality either so you know i had the i had the greatest honor of my life is to have worked with the you know the tier one seal unit and uh spend some time there and there were women in that unit they're not seals but that doesn't diminish their contribution we had women in intelligence we had women that were combat medics we had all kinds of women uh serving in various activities there in the other jsoc elements and oga as you well know um, and so we wanted to represent that. So we do have a character in the tier one series who we absolutely love. Her name is Elizabeth Grimes. And we introduced her very slowly. She came in and in the first book, she's kind of that pain in the ass that you're like, you know, she thinks I'm going to have to be the one that protects the world from these knuckle draggers and all that stuff. And she grows in her respect for these operators as they grow in respect for her. And now she's a badass, you know, she's, but we don't make her a seal. She knows, look, I can't be next to John Dempsey going through a door. I'm not right. John. But what can I do? You know what I could do? I could be on the long gun up in Overwatch. And so yeah. she's went to sniper school and she's so there are ways that she contributes. And we've made her, a, I think, a very interesting character with lots of motivation and lots of skills and uh, but also with frailties and, and just like our male characters. No one's a superhero in the book. So they're there. So they're in the books. If they're going to be in real life, they got to be in the books. One of the things, too, that, that we're starting to accept in, in the real world and therefore, you know, in the fiction world is going to come to is that uh, about 50 percent of us are female. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Turns yeah, out. <laughs> yeah, for now. Right. And they're a part of the story. So I, there's a great documentary by a guy named Dan Gabriel. It's called Mosul. And there's a fantastic character in there. And her name is Um Hana, 
Hanadi. She's a uh, two-time widow in in Mosul, and she becomes a stone cold killer of a warlord, and it, that's rare. And so she cooks for her boys, but they're out there killing ISIS like crazy. Like that's her job. And someone like that, she's like you were saying, Brian. She's made over time. You know, okay, you killed my husband. I'm going to keep going on. Get a new husband. Oh, you killed that guy too. All right, I'll tell you what. I've taken all I can stands, and I'm yeah. not going to stands anymore. You know? <laughs> and she goes out, and she just starts reaping. And she takes ISIS heads and throws them in the street. Like, she's cold blood. And this is an actual person doing actual things in actual combat. This is not a make-believe person, but what a powerful story. And to interact with her, you almost are forced to have a, a female character on the American side to – to uncover this kind of person and just to tell that part of the story is, is fascinating is still, I mean, what she does is quotey fingers masculine. You know, she imposes her will on the enemy. Well, you know, what's interesting is we act as if this is, we're the, we're the, uh, the woke generation, right. And we just invented women in combat and stuff like that. You, you can go back to world war II and look at the OSS opportunities and activities that were going on in every country they had people in in the Netherlands. They had people in France. And I mean, these women, they had female snipers. The Russians had them in their army, but we had them too. The Brits had them. Women have been in combat, whether we admit it or not, or whether we embrace it or not, for decades and decades and decades. More than that. You can go back to the Revolutionary War, and there's fascinating stories about women protecting their communities and protecting their their homeland. Their patriotism is no different. So, um, you know, we like to pretend like, look at us now. We're so we're so amazing, embracing, you know, sexual equality. No, old we news. didn't. Invent. Yeah. Yeah. Old news. Yeah. Exactly. You want to talk about an operator, Gertrude Bell. She rolled around uh, Iraq. What wasn't even Iraq yet, Iraq, uh, basically unaccompanied, unsquired in the World War One and before that, just doing whatever she thought she needed to do to do whatever needed to be done. And um, it may not look like, you know, machine guns and Rambo taking on everybody, but I would I'd guarantee you she had massive. If you guys don't know who Gertrude Bell's story is, you guys really should read about her. She's an incredible story from the early part of the 1900s. Just just a badass lady. Um, so everybody should definitely go check out Brian and Jeff's site. It's Andrews-Wilson.com. All of the books are on Amazon. It's the tier one series. The most recent one is Red Specter. You guys are going to absolutely love this stuff. That I'm going to be buying them myself. And uh, Peck, I'll read them with you. If you guys get a book, let me know. I'll start reading it with you, and we can have like a little informal book of the month club kind of thing. Um, fellas, I want to ask you, or I, I want to offer you the opportunity to ask me some questions since we got a little bit of time left. What, uh, what do you want to ask the old Pedro, the, uh, the combat spy? Well, the questions I really want to ask, we probably got to wait till we turn this off, Pete. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I'd like to know how you how you got into podcasting, and you know, sort of how it's evolved for you since you started this adventure. Yeah, it's a good question. It's usually the first question everybody asks. Um, I got into it because I wanted to tell stories. I was tired of threat and death and all that kind of thing that comes with the work that I did. And so my buddy John, who I started the show with, who's still part of the show to this day, he had a little community radio show, and we started doing that, and we realized we had some magic. And so we quickly sort of outgrew the community radio scene, um, and they had to tell us. They're like, you guys got to go. We weren't, like, banned for being – like, they're like, no, 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 go do bigger things. And the podcast was born from that. And then along the way – uh, I realized that my job was similar to what I did in combat. I'd go out and i talk to people every day and I produce a report. The show is the report. The work is like right now how we're talking. And I'm, I don't know exactly what I'm going to get into. I've got an idea of certain questions in certain situations, but it's no different than what I would do on a day-to-day -day basis, patrolling around trying to find out what the heck was going on. So it's pretty obvious when uh, when you look at your content that you stay connected to the community. How do you do that? How do you stay connected? Um, I don't seem to have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> it, and and I, I say that with all the love in the world. But because of the show, I get connected to so many veterans. I, I'm not a guy that's like a super rah-rah veteran guy. I, I love our community. I try never to say 
no to a veteran if they need help or if they need something. I try to do my best to give it to them because, um, you know, heck, I almost lost my life in this this transition out of, of the thing. So I always want to try to repay the debt that was was uh, paid to me, you know, by by having a chance to do this for a living. So um, I, I just um, I'm just part of the community and there's nothing that I can do or have to do to remain active in it. Yeah, I, I'm sure that you probably are running the, some of the same stuff that we are, you know, because we're we're always scouring the news and trying to make predictions about, you know, what we see coming down uh, the pipe, you know, geopolitically speaking. And I think we've done a pretty good job of, um, you know, in the uh, of predicting that in our series. But it's it's a rapidly uh, changing world. I mean, this this infiltration sort of by the, the Russians with the, the you know, the, the, uh, Jeff and I sort of call it their, their chaos agenda. You know, they're just wreaking havoc all over the place and they're, they're quite effective at it. And I'd be curious to take your, or hear your thoughts sort of on, you know, just the last three years, just sort of light speed of, of developments in, in, on that front. If, when you say that to me, what comes to mind for me is, is, to look in the mirror, right? Like whenever someone says corruption and I'm like, well, how about our corruption? Like what we do to corrupt Iraq, like what's corruption? Corruption is using another means than the exact, you know, the existing system to accomplish something. So we come in with bags of money to accomplish something that we're just as corrupt as anybody else. So, um, I remember a while back they had a, a research company in Afghanistan studying like how, who should be, you know, take over for Karzai and everything else. And like, wait, that's not our business. That's their business. Why are we trying to influence who the Afghanistan leader is? Like, that's as inappropriate as anything. So uh, I look at this as like the game is just played more in the open. It's it's not it's not as con- doesn't have to be as concealed now. You know, we can do things that we've always done, but there's just it's just easier to see it, I suppose. So when I look at how Russia creates chaos. I look at how we've created chaos and our inability to get some of these things right. And, and, uh, heck we deserve a lot of it because we've, you know, our, a lot of our problems in Iran stem from our inability to get Iran right a long time ago. And they rightfully yeah. hold a grudge against us. Granted they're dicks and they do, they're a rogue and they're a big problem. But if we don't know our own history, then I always say that you can't, you can't presume to improve the condition of someone or something that you don't understand the condition of it. Just looking at it and saying like China is bad because they're pushing out at the, that China has the biggest, most exploding is middle class in history of ever. And they've got to provision those people. They want medical care. They want roads. They want cars. And that stuff has to come from somewhere. So when we look at our place in the world, what is how what is China trying to maintain their problem? And, and what we don't want is them crashing. That's no good. But what's also aggressive and the same thing with Russia. How does Russia stabilize? You know, they've got rampant corruption. Well, so do we in a lot of ways. So, Brian, I don't have a good answer. I just know that we're as culpable in these things at the big level as anybody else, if not more so, because we've, we've definitely made some mistakes along the way. Because you got to pick a side, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I want us to succeed. <laughs> <laughs> Let's understand that. You know, yeah. I mean, look, I, I've been responsible, at least in my part, for for killing some really bad people. You know, someone asked today, "Are we any safer?" Twenty years later, I'm like, "Up, absolutely." I mean, there's people I've heard them say the words that no one ever wants to hear. I've I've talked to people that have gladly murdered people for for pleasure. And um, those folks don't exist anymore, partly because we went out and did things that had to be done. And uh, and Jeff, you've been with guys that have done that stuff. So, so yeah, I sleep well at night. Uh, I hold us accountable, but that's because I expect a lot of us. That's fair. Well, listen, you guys, I appreciate it. We just knocked out an hour pretty easy. Uh, I'm excited to get into these books and, and start giving them a listen. I can't wait. to. Should I start at book one or can I just jump in now with uh, Red Spectre? It, the the we write these books intentionally so you can do either one but you've got some books coming to you so you should just wait and read them all in in order i love it i love it i will, I will. hey I, I i'd like to throw this out just for your listeners pete uh we have a, a really talented phenomenal voice actor his name's ray porter he's just one of the top uh audiobook narrators in the business and he narrates this series 
So for those of you, you know, those guys that really don't have time to sit down and read a book, but you have a commute, uh, you know, whether you're in your car or you're taking a subway or whatever, you know, check us out on Audible because um, I think the experience of listening to the stories almost trumps the experience of reading them. So yeah, there's a lot uh, of people that listen. On Audible. There's a lot of people that listen and they don't care about our books. They just want to hear Ray Porter read them. He's amazing. <laughs> that guy's a, incredible. Absolutely. Yeah, the people that can act those things out there, they're, they're really great. Well, listen, fellas, I appreciate you coming on. Let's just make this a regular thing. Anytime you got something to talk about, even if it's not about a book, just come on back. Absolutely. Awesome. Enjoyed it a lot. So Thank you so much. <laughs>